We're live. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon to those of you joining online, wherever you're joining from around the world. Welcome to this session on locally led adaptation. I'm Joe Ray. I work in the climate and water team at the Netherlands Enterprise and Development Agency. Uh, we're a Dutch government organization uh, that is tasked with... Oh, somebody's alarm is going off. Could it be mine? I don't think it's mine. Excuse me. We've got an alarm clock going off at nine o'clock, so somebody's getting up quite late. Um, we're tasked with implementing elements of Dutch uh, development policy, and one of those areas that we've committed to is locally led adaptation. So I'm really looking forward to today's session because we're really going to get to grips with locally led adaptation, what it is, how it originated, why it matters to the Netherlands government, but also to other donors who've really committed to the LLA principles. Uh, and most importantly, how you can integrate it into your own work. So we're not going to kill you with PowerPoints and panels. We're going to have a few quick presentations to give you a bit of an introduction to LLA, what it is, how it came about. Somebody better get onto that alarm. Oh dear, I think it might be mine. No, it's not mine. It's not mine. Um, to make sense of all of this for us, uh, we'll be hearing from researchers, uh, from donors, from implementing partners. Um, including both here in the room and, and joining us remotely. Uh, they're going to set the scene, then we're going to go into breakout discussions, uh, including those of you who are online. Um, there will be breakout moderation for you to get really involved in the discussions. And the idea is to take these principles and apply them into your own work. So in small groups, we'll be looking at different elements of the LLA principles, the LLA approach, how you can integrate it into your own programs and activities. So to get us started and to help set the scene, I'd like to welcome uh, Roji Joshi, uh, who joins us online. She is a researcher in LLA at the International Institute for Environment and Development. Uh, Roji, over to you. Thank you, Joe. I'm glad to be part of the World Water Week online. And good morning to everyone who's joining from Stockholm and Good morning, afternoon, and evening to those who are joining online from all over the world. Um, yes, as Joe mentioned, uh, I am from IID. I am a researcher at IID, uh, and my work focuses on locally led adaptation and climate finance. Um, I'll not take much time introducing myself and would rather take time to talk about the locally led adaptation principles, just a brief highlight on what these principles are and what locally led adaptation means. So we know that climate change is a global issue, but its impacts manifest at local levels and are experienced differently according to biophysical conditions, social conditions, economic conditions, and even within communities, there are differences in the impact faced by them. And in that context, and in the given uh, context of limited climate finance reaching to the local level, limited decision-making uh, agency given to the local level, uh, the concept of principles for locally-led adaptation emerged uh, with the countries and local stakeholders increasingly demanding uh, efforts for um, agency to the local stakeholders. And um, so there was extensive uh, discussion between 2018 to 2021, uh, where different stakeholders consulted um, and did research for the uh, giving agency to the local level. And in that context, uh, these principles were co-developed between 2018 to 2021 under the Global Commission on Adaptation and the leadership of uh, Global Commissioners uh, Sheila Patel and Dr. Muhammad Musha, and these were launched in 2021 in the Climate Adaptation Summit in the Netherlands. So as I said, these were co-developed uh, under the Global Commission on Adaptation, uh, as well as uh, contributions from the LLA core partners um, and more than 50 stakeholders ranging from donors, climate funds, delivery partners, governments and social movements from across the landscape of climate action. So these principles uh, highlights the need, what needs to happen to shift the power to the local stakeholders and uh, what needs to happen uh, for the business unusual practices of implementing the adaptation actions under the leadership of the local communities. Uh, so having said that, I will move on to the next slide where we talk about these principles. 
Uh, so yeah, uh, so the first principle uh, is about uh, decision uh, making, uh, which is about devolved decision making to the um, <clears throat> Devolved decision making uh, to the lowest appropriate appropriate level, where the local institutions are given more direct access to finance and decision making power over how adaptation actions are defined, prioritized, designed, implemented, and how progress is monitored and how success is evaluated. So, in the uh, as per this first principle, the local aid, local communities who have the best knowledge of the local context text are given decision over different stages of the um, adaptation actions. The second one is addressing structural inequalities faced by women, youth, children, people with disabilities, and displaced people, indigenous peoples, and marginalized ethnic groups. Um, so we know that local communities are heterogeneous. They are composed of different uh, people, including women, youth, children, uh, indigenous people, marginalized groups. So in that context, it is very important to integrate the gender-based economic and political inequalities that are root causes of vulnerability into the core of adaptation action and encouraging vulnerable and marginalized individuals to meaningfully participate in and lead adaptation decisions. So that's principle two. And the third one is providing patient and predictable funding that can be accessed more easily. We all know that in the business as usual context, there has been challenges of delivering the finance to the local level, um, adaptation finance reaching very less to the local level. So. The need here is supporting the long-term development of local governance processes, capacity, and institutions through more simpler access modalities, longer term, and more predictable funding modalities to ensure that communities can effectively implement adaptation actions in a longer term. So the fourth one is investing in local capabilities to live an institutional legacy which focuses on improving the capabilities of local institutions to ensure that they can understand climate risk and uncertainties, generate solutions, facilitate and manage adaptation initiatives over the long term without being dependent on project-based donor funding. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, we have uh, principle five, uh, which is about building a robust understanding of climate risk and uncertainty. Um, we know that the local people have knowledge about their climatic conditions. And in that perspective, uh, what this principle stresses is about is the adaptation decisions should be informed through not just the scientific knowledge, but also a combination of local and indigenous knowledge so that it is more reflective of the local conditions and it can enable resilience under a range of future climatic scenarios. Uh, and the sixth principle is flexible programming and learning, which enables adaptive management to address the inherent uncertainty in adaptation, especially through robust monitoring and learning systems, flexible finance, and flexible programming. The seventh one, ensuring transparency and accountability. Unlike uh, the upward accountability, which is currently in practice, this principle stresses that making the processes of financing, designing, and delivering uh, programming should be more transparent and accountable downward to the local stakeholders. The final and the eighth one is collaborative action and investment, which focuses on collaboration across sectors, across stakeholders for the initiative and levels to ensure that different initiatives, um, including the initiatives from the humanitarian assistance, development, disaster risk reduction, and so on, support one another. Uh, firstly, also to avoid duplication, uh, then to enhance efficiencies, good practices, and to scale up uh, the practices. So these are the eight uh, principles of the locally-led adaptation. And over the years, since its inception, there has been uh, the um, 
increasing momentum internationally, nationally, regionally, with growing awareness and support for the principles for LLA. Now the principles of LLA have been endorsed by more than 130 organizations, which include uh, climate funds, national governments from the global north, from the global south, international development partners, federated social movements, CBOs, NGOs, and others. So now um, there are lots of growing endorsers. It's not just about saying we have got these principles, we have endorsed it, but now it's the time to operationalize the principles and it's about bringing the real change. Um, so in a nutshell, locally led adaptation is not just about <clears throat> It's not just about delivering adaptation benefits at the local level um, or getting local people to participate in a project, but it is about local people and their communities having individual and collective agency over defining, priority, prioritizing, designing, monitoring, and evaluating adaptation actions and working together with a range of stakeholders for increased efficiency and scaled up actions. Um, this makes sure that the adaptation actions are um, uh, are reflective of the local conditions, respecting the local knowledge and uh, uh, indigenous practices, and also ensuring that there is more of uh, downward accountability. So yeah, that's about the principles. If you'd like to know more about the principles, here is the QR code. You can scan this QR code and get more information about the LLA principles. Um, yeah, with that, I'd like to stop sharing about these principles and would like to hand over back to Joe. Thank you. Thanks, Roji, um, for providing us with the context. I think it's really important to understand we're going to have a bit of a deep dive on these principles, but it's really key first to set the scene on why and how they emerge and the problems that they're trying to address. So thank you for, for setting the stage for us. Uh, two of the governments that have really led the way on uh, the LLA principles, we saw the, the list of organizations up there with the, the logos of those who've endorsed it, and more than 130 now, and that number continues to grow. Um, but two of the leaders amongst that group are the United States and the United Kingdom. So I'm very pleased to say that we have both uh, the US Agency for International Development and the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office with us in the room. Um, perhaps I can bring in now Lisa Schechtman um, from USAID. Uh, Lisa, maybe you can tell us why does this matter, uh, and how does the, the United States integrate LLA into its programming? So, welcome. Thank you, Joe. Um, I will do my best. Um, Dan and I will tag team, though, as, as we often do. Um, so I think we've just heard a really amazing overview of the principles, and it's important to keep these in mind. Um, many of them are kind of basic principles of good development that we've all sort of agreed to for decades and still struggle to implement. Um, but I think these are really critical because they focus in on climate change, which is such an ever-present um, threat that we all need to be working together to address. So these principles are also especially important for water. Um, you're here at Stockholm World Water Week. Hopefully I don't need to convince you that the impacts of climate change are changes on water. Um, the two go very hand in hand. And so where I sit in USAID's Center for Water Security, Sanitation and Hygiene, these LLA principles are woven into and core to everything that we do. Uh, but it's not just water. Under the current administration, the Biden-Harris administration, and under our USAID administrator, Samantha Power, localization has become a major priority for the government. And that includes our domestic programs as well as our international programs. Um, so what does that mean? Well, USAID provides, on average, about $1 billion a year in humanitarian and development assistance to water and sanitation. That makes us one of the largest donors to the sector in the world. Um, and it means that every step we take towards implementing the LLA principles has um, the potential to have a meaningful impact. Um, and so we take that responsibility very seriously. But we know this isn't easy. And from a donor standpoint, localization is really about changing power dynamics. So it's about changing who gets the money and who helps decide where the money 
goes, how it's implemented, what the activities look like, where the geographies are, what the solutions are. So across USAID, we have this localization agenda, um, and it applies to every sector in the agency, and we implement across a lot of sectors. Um, what that looks like in practice is applying localization principles, such as the LLA principles, to existing sector strategies and policies, and really making sure that it's all racking up to a total global level um, accountability structure that we have internally for how many of our programs are being implemented by local partners and what proportion of our funding is going to local partners. So in the water and sanitation space, that's implemented under the U.S. Global Water Strategy, which is a whole of government strategy that's actually required by law and is jointly led by USAID and the U.S. Department of State. Um, and it has four objectives. Um, the first is looking at governance, finance, strengthening markets, and strengthening institutions. The second is about wash access. The third is about protecting freshwater and uh, associated ecosystems, so including things like biodiversity. And then the fourth is preventing and mitigating water-related conflict, the humanitarian peace development access. Across all four of those, the qualifier climate resilient or climate adaptive is part of the definition of the objective and part of the definition of how we will get there. Um, but then we also have one step further. Um, we have a principle that's focused on climate resilience and a principle that's focused on reaching marginalized communities and those in vulnerable situations. And so we've tried to create a multi-layer accountability structure that brings the localization principles to bear. Um, so I'll say a little bit more about what that looks like in practice, um, but I wanna pull back one step and just point out the other component of what USAID is trying to do, which is to leverage our convening power. Um, we know that as the US government, we have the opportunity to do direct outreach, use our relationships with other governments, um, you know, stand up at events like this and say, we think these principles matter, join these other 130 partners that have endorsed and um, try and bring others in. Um, so for example, last year, we, with, uh, together with the government of Ireland, launched a campaign specifically focused on the LLA principles to try and bring other governments on board. Um, and between August and December last year, we spoke to more than 20 governments about the LLA principles, just trying to educate them, um, you know, endorse them as vocally as possible, have quiet conversations about what it looks like, public conversations about what it looks like. Um, and in that process, the United States and Ireland were able to get um, an additional seven governments to endorse the LLA principles. That's great on paper. The accountability is what happens next. Um, so for us, what that means is we're really trying to change the way our programs work. So as I said, power dynamics, where the money goes, who decides how the money gets used. Under the US Global Water Strategy, we have selected 22 high priority countries for water and sanitation assistance. Those countries are across Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and Latin America and the Caribbean. And they're selected according to their need for wash services, their levels of water insecurity, um, and the um, opportunities to improve intersectional outcomes by providing wash services. So that could look like girls' education, reductions in maternal mortality, reductions in water-related conflict, et cetera. Um, each of those 22 countries develops their own national level plan for how they will contribute to the global, US global water strategy. Um, and those plans are determined in country in alignment with national government priorities and in consultation with local government stakeholders. No two plans are the same, and that's how it should be because no two contexts are the same. But one thing that is consistent is that they're all reflecting localization principles and they're all looking at climate adaptation and resilience. So that means that the climate realities in the places that we're working are woven across 
the water and sanitation investments. And when I say water, I do want to clarify, I mean water resources management as well as drinking water. Um, so I'll close with just a couple of very, very short examples. Um, in Peru, we are partnering with the government of Canada and the government of Peru um, to collaborate with women's empowerment networks and indigenous women's networks to draw on traditional uh, pre-Incan technologies for water resources management, which is not only protecting water resources and freshwater environments, but also driving um, investments in safe drinking water projects. In Indonesia, our local partners are using nature-based solutions, again, drawn from traditional knowledge to pr protect their freshwater resources. And all of these programs and many others like them are accountable for using indicators that help us understand how we're contributing to localization and to climate change, as well as to SDG 6. Um, so I will, I will stop talking and turn it over back to Joe and Dan, but just to say, it's not easy. Um, we're trying really hard, and um, it's really great to see so many people in the room kind of committed to doing this difficult work together. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Lisa. And lots to pick out there, but one of the things that stood out to me is you talk about USAID applying these principles to existing sector strategies and policies, and I think that's a really important point to dwell on because when we go into the breakouts, we're going to be talking about how these principles, which are very beautiful, but very abstract still, can actually be integrated into a whole range of different you know, policies, programs, and, and different contexts. So a uh, really good point to, to highlight there. Um, I'd like now to bring in uh, Dan Shuster Beasley from the UK uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Dan, same question to you. Why does it matter? How do you integrate this into your policies and programming? So welcome. Thanks, Joe. And uh, thanks, Lisa. Um, as I said at the start, you know, we'll kind of tag team this and, and build off each other. The UK and the, the US have um, sort of been there from the start in terms of the development of the LLA principles and really signing up uh, right at the start in, in January 2021 when they were launched. Um, so straight, straight to the question, I mean, why? I mean, we heard about the, the principles and what they are, but when you're a government and you're looking at these things and there are sort of uh, endless things to sign up to and endless sort of possibilities of way to take forward, what we're always asking is, well, what's the evidence? Why are we taking this forward? What's it actually going to deliver, not just for us, but for the people who are trying to benefit? And when it comes to locally-led adaptation, the evidence is growing and the evidence is clear. Locally-led climate action is highly effective. And finding from whether it's international development, bilateral and climate funds, it's all showing that when you reach local communities with the funding and with the decision-making, you're delivering a triple win. You're producing more sustainable results at lower cost. You're developing local capacity and generating climate positive and sustainable solutions. Um, and you're delivering uh, local economic be development benefits as well. So as this empirical evidence grows, we're seeing more and more people engage in this conversation through that lens, understanding not just sort of the principles of why this is important, but actually also the real results of why doing this uh, makes sense. Um, Lisa mentioned that um, one of the real benefits from an LLA approach is just that each context is highly specific and highly different. And as donors, we have to recognize that we don't have that knowledge. We don't have it at our um, headquarters. And even when we're doing it through our country offices and our, our vast network, we don't actually have that, that specific contextual knowledge in not just at country level, but local level, regional level, basin level when it comes to water. Um, that is so critical when we're looking at climate adaptation and climate needs. So the evidence is clear, the principles are selling, but it's still difficult to actually take this forward. And I think it's worth just reflecting on um, some of the challenges that, that are faced, both in taking this forward as any institution, but often particularly for, for donors. The first is that we need to move away from a business as usual. This is not business as usual. And one of the things that it requires is a real mind check, mind, mindset shift. For countries such as the UK, but countries across the world, this includes a decolonization ethos, something that is not easy to confront, not easy to face up to, but something that we must do. It's about looking 
at a longer-term perspective on funding. It is about recognising that short-term approaches, short-term funding models, don't work for LLA. They don't work for any model, really, but specifically for LLA. It's about that long-term investment. It's about the capacity building as well. Um, it's about building that trust and partnerships with other national governments and local organisations. It's about removing ourselves from a top-down model and really bringing ourselves to the table as partners in the work that we do. And one of the hardest ones for donors is a ceding of control in decision-making and recognising and trusting in the local organisations that they know best and that we understand that through partnering through locally led adaptation, we're going to be delivering those, those triple wins I mentioned at the start. So the UK, um, uh, as I mentioned, was uh, one of the forerunners in signing up to the LLA principles um, and continues to support this, not just in terms of the individual programmes we do, but also about the sort of system shift that is required. And so alongside the importance of the work that Lisa was talking through the USAID, building this into existing strategies, existing programs, the UK is looking at this alongside that in terms of what are the broader systems changes that are needed to make sure that LLA becomes the norm. And we look at this um, recognizing that those challenges I was mentioning remain that other donors are not quite where we are, um, and that there is still this inherent kind of conversation and understanding of risk. What is the risk of locally led adaptation? Is that risk within our appetites? And again, it's about bringing us back to the evidence and showing that actually when we see the results, when we see what's delivered on the ground, the answer is clear, it is. So one of the programmes which the UK has been supporting since uh, 2020 is the LIFE AR programme. The LIFE AR is an LDC formulated, owned and led initiative that sets out a long-term vision and strategy for changing how climate finance is accessed, managed and targeted with an objective that by 2030, at least 70% of climate finance will be supporting locally led actions across the LDCs. Again, what I was saying, that the, the key thing about the Life AR program, and one of the things that is, is um, core to our approach, is that this isn't project specific. This program, the Life AR, is looking at the financial systems and is saying, if we want to actually be driving long-term change and benefit for locally led adaptation, we need to make sure that the whole financial institu institutions, and that includes involving private sector more, which is a great challenge when it comes to locally led adaptation. It's about the, the longer term strategies, ensures that as the sort of vast sums of money that go into climate finance, and as the climate finance discussions are happening at COPs and amongst sort of donors, et cetera, that the sort of natural norm is for a large chunk of that to just flow to the communities. And that's what the Life AR program is specifically aimed at. The UK um, is funding 12 million pounds um, to support the uh, Life AR program. And the currently working in 10 countries. Um, and it's sort of at its early stages now of having had the country selection of now really embedding those principles and really working with partners to understand what the, the next steps are. So it's a very exciting stage for the program. Life AR isn't the only way that um, the UK government though is engaging with uh, locally led adaptation. Um, we also are engaging through the uh, Reducing Environmental Degradation in Africa and Asia program, which funds work that is locally led and helps both people and nature thrive together um, in a program uh, of competitive grant calls, technical support to grantees, and in spreading knowledge generated to the local community. So just a couple of other um, comments, and then we'll, we'll open it up to, oh, I'll hand back to, to Joe. Um, and again, it's about those challenges that we face, and what are the next steps that you know, the UK, the US, the Dutch, and other donors can support in the conversations we have with our partners, but also that all of you can be doing um, in the conversations that you have as I said, there's this challenging shift in mindset, the decolonization ethos, the, the long-term funding, but there are other challenges. We need to do more to focus on capacity building, 
Um, we need to do more to focus on the weak capacity to manage the flows of climate finance at national level. Um, we need to bring the private sector in meaningfully and early. Um, great conversation um, that the Valuing Water Initiative and, and Joe and others have been leading um, really around that, that piece. Um, and it's recognizing that locally led, it's not a one size fits all and it's not always appropriate. So it's about also recognizing when is this the most appropriate approach and not doing a sort of uh, a blanket approach and recognizing there are going to be some contexts where actually there does need to be national level, it does need to be regional level. Locally led has its place and its place is contextual and needs to be contextualized for each and every country, region and local basin. I'll leave it there. Um, there's more that we can discuss in questions, more specific about the water focus, the fragile conflict affected states focus as well. Um, but that was just a sort of brief overview to kick things off. Wonderful, thanks so much, Dan, and, and, uh, and thanks also to FCDO for your leadership on this theme. Um, the point you make about context being important is, is also, I think, very well reflected in the principles. So principle one talks about devolving decision-making to the lowest appropriate level. But of course, you can have a discussion on what appropriate is, and, and, and that, you know, whatever, what is appropriate will differ in, in different contexts. So good to, to make that point as well there. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about you know, what the principles are, why they matter, and, and how they're being integrated into donor programming from two different government perspectives. Um, but we haven't yet really dived into the implementation. So what does an LLA project actually look like in practice? So to unpack this for us, I'd like to bring in uh, my colleague, Karen Stehauer from the Netherlands Enterprise and Development Agency. Uh, and joining us from Kenya, we have James Mamer from Impact Kenya and Jackson Nkaiduri from the Musul community. Um, together, they're gonna tell us a little bit about how this actually uh, comes together in a really practical context on the ground. So, Karen, welcome, and let's kick us off. Yeah, good morning. Um, I work on a program that is called uh, Reversing the Flow. That is um, a program by the Netherlands government. And in that program, we try uh, to implement um, locally led adaptation principles, all the eight of them, uh, which, uh, can be challenging, but um, I want to take you through this uh, concept uh, on how we do that, and then uh, I will hand over to our colleagues in Kenya to provide you the more practical side of, of it. So Reversing the Flow is a program uh, that supports uh, water security and climate resilience uh, through community-led action in the fields of water resources management, landscape restoration, and uh, climate change adaptation. Um, that is done in a specific landscape. Um, it applies a landscape approach. And um, what I expect, especially want to explain to you is how that then works. So the funding is coming from the Netherlands government. As the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, we manage the program and we provide uh, subsidies to what we have called RTF hubs. Those are our partners and they are in 10 different landscapes in five countries, and they function as a kind of intermediary in those landscapes to facilitate a participatory process with local communities, different local groups, other stakeholders that have their stake in the landscape, and um, they facilitate a process to identify the key issues, but also to talk about the aspirations of the local groups in that landscape, aspirations of other stakeholders to agree on priorities and um, in the end to provide small grants to those uh, local groups to enable them to implement and realize um, their own priorities themselves. Um, together, the hub, the local groups discuss how they will um, arrange that, what are the criteria for those uh, projects that get funding, how do they monitor that together, um, how do they report on their expenditure, um, and that will be different in all 10 cases, because in every context it will have different backgrounds, people will have different priorities, and people will make different arrangements with each other. 
Um, so it is a bottom-up and locally owned uh, program um, in order to um, support appropriate and sustainable uh, solutions. And um, I want to leave it to, uh, to this um, because um, James and uh, Jackson uh, will provide you um, the more practical insight into the program of how they do that in, in Kenya, in Laikipia and um, Isiolo County. So over to you, James. Hello, uh, good morning. This is Patrick uh, Leresi from Impact Kenya. Yeah, Impact is a non-profit organization. We are based in, in Northern Kenya. Uh, our office is in Laikipia, uh, Nanyuki area. We operate uh, in three uh, wards. We operate in two wards in Laikipia, Laikipia North, uh, Mugodo East and Mugodo West and we also operate in Isiolo County, uh, Burat Ward. Uh, basically, uh, the, the organization uh, is a build, uh, is a peace building, uh, human rights, uh, governance, landscape, uh, uh, land rights, uh, police advocacy, and community development organization. Um, communities uh, in the landscape uh, faces many challenges. One is the drought. Uh, climate change, uh, inter-community inter conflict, uh, uh, resource-based conflict, uh, human-wildlife uh, conflict. Uh, there are also an aspect of development partners, uh, manipulations, uh, top-down decision-making, uh, 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 traditional knowledge, uh, the aspect of undermining traditional knowledge, uh, money-driven uh, projects, and yes, for the benefit of RTF, uh, RTF has really, reju uh, have really uh, rejuvenated back our communities uh, to, to normal, to the way they are supposed to exist. One is that uh, it has brought the respect of com communities are able to make their decision making. Communities, uh, uh, knowledge is being appreciated. The community structures uh, in terms of governance is being appreciated. Uh, so RTF have really changed the narrative of how projects are, uh, uh, how pro projects are initiated in the communities. Yeah, the aspect of it's community driven, it's decision, uh, it's no longer money driven, it's community needs priority. And it has brought a lot of respect because uh, the communities are able to use their traditional uh, structures the uh, traditional knowledge uh, in terms of uh, uh, implementing, uh, implementing, prioritizing their needs, and also working as a community. The unity uh, is, is is there now. The aspect of also uh, community sustainability projects. It has been an issue over the years, but now because it's uh, it's their needs, it's their priority and it's them who are implementing, we are seeing a sense in terms of uh, projects, ownership uh, and, and sustainability of this project. Uh, so basically, RTF is, is, uh, is bringing, is changing the narrative and it's solving a lot of challenges. One of the challenges is the aspect of intercommunity conflict because they are, now the communities have got a chance to, to manage the landscape, uh, interconnect the landscape and, they are given the, the period, they are given the chance to, to manage themselves. So the community, there is a community coming together and they also formed a, a governance structure across the landscape that they have uh, the, the, the top uh, governance structure formed by them and also they have the, the world level projects, uh, uh, governance uh, structures. So the community learn from each other, the, the interward, uh, who foresee the entire project, but the, the world uh, uh, governance structures look at the world levels. So the communities are able to move from one community to the next one and learn what the other communities are doing, what are the challenges. And when it comes to the community resource sharing, they are able to connect with the, uh, each, 
sorry, is each each community, and they're able to chair uh, their plans at the landscape level. The other issue is uh, the aspect of water. Water has been an issue grazing, uh, grazing for conflict. So communities are unable because of uh, the structures they are unable now to share their plans and where the communities are resting for 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 recovery. The other communities understand uh, the plan with the other communities and they understand the land uh, the land situation, degradations, the need to rest, the need for restoration, and, and so on. The other thing is about water. Water has been a big challenge across the landscape, and and and, and now the issue, the communities are now addressing water challenges, and we have some boss of communities that have been able to to revive back their water projects. They are managing it and they are sharing with us. Uh, the other thing is human wildlife conflict. The, the area has been taken over uh, over the years by invasive species. Some of in, some of the species species were introduced unknowingly as ornamentals, but they take over the land, and uh, it has been a source of conflict because they have been attractive uh, attracting human wildlife conflict. Some of the area has been uh, taken by elephants uh, because. The other area is degraded, and now that's the area they can only get feeds, and especially during the dry spells. So uh, restoration across the landscape is creating a bigger area. It's creating bigger spaces uh, for wildlife, uh, so they no longer concentrate within those areas. And the communities are also removing some of the invasive species. Uh, so it's, it's really reducing uh, human wildlife conflict, and it's uh, the, because of the, the the regeneration of the land, the communities are also, uh, it's no longer an issue, it's a bigger problem because each area, communities are trying to restore it back. So resources are increasing uh, across the landscape. So uh, uh, I want to hand over to my colleague, but uh, the other aspect I want you to, 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 to talk is about uh, the governance structures. The governance structures have been a bigger challenge across the landscape. And revival of the traditional uh, governance structure, community governance structures is really uh, helping us as uh, because it's highly respected within communities. It's highly, the laws that are used is highly respected, it's accepted by communities, and it's really uh, helping to, to address the issues of conflict around uh, among the, the communities is uh, is accepted within and inter communities because it's the same systems as you go to the next community uh, you still find the same system and there are commonalities among among it so i want to hand over to one of the community members to to explain how they are using uh, how the reverse the flow is actually Assisting community at Mission Community Land. Yeah, good morning from the other side. I'm Jackson Gaidori from Musuru Community Land. Uh, I'm the community land manager, and uh, I'd like just to take this opportunity to attest some of the good things that uh, we have witnessed or uh, experienced out of the reversing the flow. Uh, well, my community, my community, we are pastorals. Uh, that's our activity. That's what we normally do. And out of this one, uh, we, we, we are my community benefited from RTF funds, whereby my community received two million up to now. And uh, some of the things we we prioritize as the community is a uh, land restoration. Uh, this uh, 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 model of uh, funding community direct is is community based. Uh, because whatever we have done, it's not from Impact Kenya, not from another person, but we have just sat down as community and we decided to do land restoration. And up to now, my community, we have able to do uh, around 300 acres piece of land. And uh, my community sat down, they decided to, uh, they just to analyze our problems. We had a lot of challenges as pastoralists since we didn't have sufficient grass in our land. So we decided to do land restoration. Uh, out of this one, uh, this one has actually benefited my community because we were able to control uh, bare land in, in my area. And that's how 
By doing this one, we are used to construct what we call the half moons or the circular bands. Then we do receding. Then at the, at when we do receding, we are able to receive enough or sufficient for our livestock. Uh, this actually, uh, uh, this project actually uh, has been a, a very beneficial to my community. One, it has united uh, our people since we get time, we come together and work together. And uh, we normally, uh, it takes created a lot of unity. Number two, uh, when we had uh, we have a sufficient grass, it also created peace because every community now has sufficient grass for their lives. Also, there's no any conflict over over the grass. Uh, number two, human wildlife conflict also because we also we live with the pastoral, we live with wildlife, so we interact. We get enough uh, or sufficient uh, grass, so there's no big competition. Uh, during also when we are doing this activity, there's also invasive species that have enriched the area. Uh, we have some species like Opuntia, and the other one called Ipomea. Where when we are doing this one, uh, we also when we are restoring the land, we are also managed to remove this species, species, invasive species, so which have been a very big disaster in our area. Uh, another beneficial of this project, actually, when we did this one, we are able to gain a lot of knowledge uh, on how to control system circular bands. And we are also made to an extent to go each and every person around their homestead. We construct the same circular bands or we do receding. So actually the community they are doing and they are self-driven in doing this one. And through this, actually, so they had so many existing projects within the, our community there before. But through, through this method uh, or this mode, uh, of community being funded directly. This com this project now uh, being won by community themselves, and they, 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 they also speak as their own project because it's their own idea, and they did on their own way, uh, uh, the best way, and so uh, so that they can solve their uh, their own project. Uh, also, when we are doing this one, also uh, we everyone is engaged or is involved in decision making. They are initially, according to our culture, it's men to decide. But right now, it's not only men. The women are also there. They are also part of decision making, and they are also part of the management. Uh, also, the uh, the young generation, that's the youth, they are also part of this one. And everyone is involved when it, the work is being done in the field. No, there's no any special class of people which are just around to make the uh, which are allowed to make decisions, but in the whole community are part of decision making and part of the work when the work is being is being done in the field. Uh, and actually, uh, I just say that this LLA method is one of the best, and we actually request as community for any person of goodwill, actually you're much welcome, interact with us, share uh, and support us. Because we have a very big track of land that still needs to be restored. But actually, uh, by using this method, actually, we will do something. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much from my two colleagues, Patrick and um, uh, Jackson, here. I know time is almost over, but just to make the final conclusion about uh, the restore program uh, that have been implemented through the RTF and how uh, we can. Now bring this context to the in, even the international level. Uh, looking at uh, the locally led adaptation, uh, the principles communities are most affected by climate change should be the forefront in uh, crafting solution. And this is when uh, this is how the locally led adaptation principles comes in. And uh, through RTF, their model that is direct funding. When we we fund these communities directly, it means they have the opportunity to prioritize their need. And uh, when you look at uh, the top-down approach, most projects have been implemented in Northern Kenya, but to what level? There is no much success stories. But uh, with this one year of uh, uh, funding communities directly, it means we have documented a lot of success stories from communities. So basically, it means maybe this is the tool to tackling climate change. And uh, when you look at, uh, for example, the Paris Agreement, uh, Article 7, uh, which emphasizes on the importance of adaptation efforts that are driven by local communities, then it means these are some of the, uh, the ways uh, funders can uh, tackle 
all these bureaucratic uh, principles, even uh, at the high level or the high table, so that funding can go directly to communities. And uh, just a, as a closing remark, uh, the synergy between locally led adaptation, that is direct funding, uh, looking at the Paris Agreement, the Sustainable Development Goals, it's a powerful pathway to achieving water security and peaceful and sustainable ecosystem. Uh, it's a time we shift our focus to empowering local communities, recognize them not just as beneficiaries of adaptation efforts, but as a true leader of climate resilience. Uh, if we work together to ensure that uh, the voices of those in the front line of climate change are heard, then we support and fund directly this community. It means we will have uh, a success story that uh, uh, will be able to mitigate climate change. So the intersection between the scientific knowledge and uh, traditional knowledge is something that needs to be uh, discussed further so that we allow communities to make decisions by themselves and to carry this project for themselves for ownership purposes and uh, to uh, make it more inclusive as well. From Jackson's story, you can feel that uh, these communities, uh, the, uh, the level of biodiversity has increased. The uh, wildlife have come, uh, came back to communities. And when you look at Laikipia, for example, it's a more area that's, uh, there's a lot of fences, for example. There's a lot of conserved areas. But where are the wildlife? They are in the community areas because uh, the communities are slowly restoring their land. So even the wildlife feel uh, more secure, they have more grass to come and graze uh, at this area. I'm sure we will share a lot from uh, the breakout session. And also, if you have any question, uh, we can uh, you can always uh, consult or contact us because of time. We will have much to share. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, James Patrick Jackson. Wonderful to have you with us. Um, thank you for making the time this morning and, uh, and for sharing with us a really practical example of, of what LLA actually looks like in action. And in simple terms, it's about putting communities in charge of their own future uh, and their own adaptation to climate change. Um, so thank you for that very compelling example. Um, time to get practical now for those here in the room and those of you uh, with us online. Uh, we're going to go into breakout groups. So we'd like to try the one, two, all format. Some of you may be familiar with this. Um, each of the tables in the room has one of the LLA principles. Um, we'd like you to take a look at the principle that's on your table, reflect for a few moments on your own. How would you integrate this principle into your own work? Maybe it's your own studies, maybe you're involved in programming, perhaps it's policy, perhaps you're coming at this from another angle. Think about how you would integrate it, take a few moments, make some notes, and then turn to the person next to you and discuss it with them. What do you have in common? Do you have any shared obstacles? Are there shared opportunities that you see? Does the person next to you see this differently? Do they interpret the principle differently? So take a few moments then to discuss it with uh, the partner next to you. And then we will open it out um, to the full table. So one, two, all. We've got about, I would say, 25 minutes or so for this. And then we'll have a quick round of reflections and some closing remarks. Those of us who are here organizing will be going around the tables and helping to facilitate the discussions. So for those of you online, uh, you have an online moderator who will be helping you um, uh, do this collectively. Please get stuck in, get involved. And uh, we will be making our way around the room to. Uh, facilitate the discussion. Thanks.
we got 10 minutes, and I'm going to be ruthless about the time, yeah, so yeah, I'm going to. I made it in, yeah, I, I just arrived. You just arrived? I'm sorry to intrude. We, they're going to be really militant about cutting our mics off okay. at half past. We've got 12 minutes. Okay. I want to go to, like, just a couple of tapes. So I'll give you the closing words then, yeah? Yeah. Very good. This is one of the answers that John never made clear his idea of exactly what it's Perfect. Okay. Brilliant. So the community, how can we um, organize that? So you bring up an interesting uh, element. Sarah, we're sorry to interrupt. We're going to go back into the plenary now. All right, folks, let's see if there's a glass I can, uh, no, that doesn't work, does it? All right, I'd like to invite everybody to just wrap up their conversations now. We've got 11 minutes left, and then I'm told by the organizers that our mics are going to be cut, and that's the end of discussion because we go to the next session. So um, I hope that was illuminating for everybody. Just in the next few minutes, we want to have a very quick round of reflections from the tables. We won't have time to get to every table, but my colleague Karen is walking around with a mic, um, so please put your hand up if you'd like to make a comment, ask a clarifying question, or just reflect on what you've heard today. Um, I went around the tables, heard some really interesting discussions, uh, so I'm sure we have a couple of things we can bring out in the room. And then in the last three minutes or so, I will hand over to uh, my colleague from the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs for some final reflections. Um, so, who would like to go first? Yes, question here. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is our table. We actually had a very um, deliberate discussion about it. We think this is a very good move. Reversing the flow is really very important. Um, it will bring effectiveness in the aid that we give, and it would also actually be something that the communities would need, and then they can work towards sustainability. However, we had some challenges. Uh, we know that these communities have to understand um, the principles that you've listed, the aid of them to be able to uh, organize themselves very well, be accountable for their money. So the question is, would we have to fund twice? Mm. Fund the communities directly and also fund the NGOs that will be facilitating them? And how do we get the metrics right mm. that the donor knows that actually what the community is doing is bringing value for money? So that is something that we talked about. And we also recommend that this should actually be something for the entire development. It shouldn't just be on climate change, but it should either be um, other sectors that are actually happening in the community should all go through the reverse uh, flow system. Yeah. Thank you. Great, wonderful comment. Thank you. I mean, there are questions in there, but these are also rhetorical questions. They're, they're not things we can answer easily on the spot, but I, th I think your point about this being relevant for the whole development agenda is really key. So we talk about locally led adaptation because it has a climate adaptation focus, but of course, you know, localization and, and devolving decision making to the lowest appropriate level, patient funding and so forth, the, the principles are applicable right across the development spectrum. So it's a really good point. Uh, yeah, other questions or reflections at the back there. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for that session. It was really um, brilliant. Um, I'm Jeff McConnell from WaterAid. Um, I think we were thinking about um, the longevity of, of these programs. I think it was Daniel mentioned that these cannot be short term and these need to be um, for for the long haul. Um, and our 
our kind of topic for conversation was ensuring transparency and accountability. Um, and so we were talking about commitments from, from donors to reduce the complexity of, of their requirements, to support with that. And um, so if we look at principle one, um, and also private and INGO sectors supporting that and, and helping with that transition and, and ourselves acknowledging the ceiling that we have in our, in our role in this. I guess the, the broader question and a rhetorical one as well is, how do we make sure that is sustainable? As we see governments transition, as we see new administrations come in, how do we get long-term commitment to this so that we don't waste the gains that have been made so far if a new administration comes in and decides to take a change of direction? Yeah. Great comment question. One quick reflection on that from my side is I think Dan made the point earlier about developing an evidence base. So ma no matter who the political administration is, if there is a commitment to the development agenda, no matter how great that commitment is, if there's a strong evidence base, which is certainly emerging around locally led adaptation being more effective in terms of results, but also more cost effective from the donor perspective, I would suggest that's perhaps a starting point for having that conversation. Yeah, uh, Karen, I think there's a question here. Okay, thank you. Um, so our group uh, was discussing integrating gender-based economic and political inequalities that are root causes of vulnerability um, into adaptation action. And um, a question that arose was, what do you do as far as locally led um, principles if the government that you're working with is not interested in supporting those um, into adaptation decisions? Yeah, that's, that's a good remark. And that's also the challenge of what the most appropriate level is. If you want to work directly with the communities, is there a way that you can also engage with other layers of governance, whether it's national, regional, local government? Um, I think that's a very important point, yeah. Um, there's a question online. One online, yes. Two more minutes. Uh, thank you so much. It's, mo it's not more of a question, but uh, just a reflection from our group uh, uh, our breakout session and uh, for us we were looking at uh, the first principle devolving decision making to the lowest appropriate level and uh, uh, I just want to say that uh, at the heart of locally led adaptation uh, the principles that uh, communities uh, most affected by climate change should be the forefront of crafting solutions and uh, these communities possess invaluable knowledge and uh, this can be uh, uh, can be shown or can be uh, can be seen from how RTF has helped communities in Kenya and other hubs across the world. And this community knowledge can be a connecting point between the environment as well as making them uniquely equipped, that is in cultural connection to the environment, strategies, by devolving decision-making power to the local level, we not only empower communities, but also ensure that solutions are context-specific and culturally relevant. So I think um, one of our colleagues also had a question on, um, on uh, transparency as well as accountability. Once communities are given this power, it's usually uh, in, our, in our context, it has been so transparent because it is given to a uh, community directly to decide for themselves. So I feel like at the top level, if we can push for locally led adaptation, a principle to guide uh, how funders, how governments uh, prioritize their need, then it means uh, we can be able to mitigate uh, some of the climate change effects. Thank you so much. Thank you, James. I think it's a really, a really nice concluding remark to, to finish this, this part on. We, we could go on, this conversation could go on a lot longer, and, and I hope it will after the session. Three minutes left in the agenda. I'd like to bring in my colleague Martin Gisler from the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs to very briefly, concisely wrap this all up for us and tell us what comes next. No pressure, Martin. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was a great, it was a very interesting session. Um, a lot of recognition for me, recognition from uh, the colleagues from the US and, and uh, UK about how difficult this is, these locally led adaptation principles um, and everything that comes in from the decolonization agenda, this patient funding in a situation where we're always impatient, um, seizing control, locally led versus our bureaucracies who love to be centrally led and, and our risk tolerance we have an incredible tolerance for making mistakes over and over and over again ourselves, but we have very low tolerance 
again, mistakes um, that would be made by local communities. So, you know, risk tolerance is also a, a sort of complex notion. Um, I think um, we have to see this in a multi-level governance context, yeah? And as a civil servant and in the civil service, we, we think governance is the government business, so we think about governance structures of the state from central to local. But of course, there are also governance structures in community outside the state. And I think the areas and the, the challenges that we're trying to work with, they have to divide this bridge between the formal structures and the informal structures. And I think, uh, Karen, you mentioned bridging divides. Huh? So I think an, in, an, an organization like Impact is sort of straddling this formal informal divide. Yeah? They stand with one leg, or maybe with one and a half leg, in the local communities, but they also understand how our bureaucracies and our civil service works and how you can accommodate a sort of different accountability relation between impact and us and a very different kind of relation between impact and the, the communities. I think what is also interesting to note is that have we locally led, I mean there can be drops in an ocean, but this the reversing the flow program tries to do this landscape approach and I like landscape approach over water resources or basin approach because it's very much cross-sectoral. Water is cross-sectoral by nature. And so we have to um, often, from our donor perspective, we're trying to satisfy ourselves solving water problems. But if you go to these landscapes, I mean, the water problems are so integrated with the food prob problems, with the economic problems, with the wildlife community, uh, conflicts, etc. So, so this is totally cross-sectoral in nature. And so if we are too water focused and our money has to solve water problems, we're not going to um, succeed. I think uh, that's it. <laughs>